Well, good morning. Welcome to Cross Community Church. Uh, Today, I just want to open by celebrating, first of all, um, all of you who uh, served going back to the work day where we were preparing for Easter. Those of you who uh, showed up early and stayed late last week serving other people. uh, You know, God gave us the opportunity to minister to 1,267 people at both of our campuses last week. And Listen, those numbers matter to us because every one of those individuals matters to God. He loves them and cares for him, and we got to share with them the hope of the gospel. And so, uh, well done. Thank you again for your service. Yeah, quite, quite a blessing. Pacola Campus set a record attendance there, too. So uh, just, just a, a wonderful day celebrating our risen Savior, Jesus. Now, today, we are beginning a new series called The Elephant in the Room. And and really, what this series is, is an an extension of our series we did through 1 Peter. So in 1 Peter, um, we we talked about embracing our role as exiles, as believers who live in a world that isn't necessarily our home, right? We, We are now citizens of a new kingdom, God's kingdom, but we still live here on this earth. And so in 1 Peter, he was teaching us as believers, how do we live? this out? How do we contend for the faith in the midst of a world that doesn't always accept our views or the the truthfulness of Scripture or even the truth of the gospel? How do we live that out? Well, what we wanted to do in this series is take a few very specific issues that we as believers deal with in our culture and talk about how should we think about these issues? What does the Bible have to say about them? And then ultimately, how do we speak this to culture? Because here's the thing. The issues we're talking about in this series are things that we deal with both in the church and in the culture at large. The culture is trying to come up with answers for these questions. So what I believe is that the church ought to look into the Word, and we ought to lead the way when it comes to the difficult issues that we're facing. And so the church ought to say, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life, and the culture needs us to lead on difficult issues and not just lag behind looking to culture to know how we should think or believe. And let me just say this to you parents. It's true of you as well as your kids. You and your children are being discipled by something, right? They might be discipled by TikTok or Reels or Shorts on Facebook. Uh, They might be uh, discipled by their kids or someone in the media. You are being discipled. And so let me just encourage you, be intentionally discipled by God's Word and by His church. Submit yourself to the teaching of the Word, and man, watch what God does. It begins to bear good fruit in your life. Now, the issues that we're going to be talking about in this series, they're difficult. I'm not going to lie. Um, I was probably more nervous to preach this week than I was last week on Easter uh, because, uh, I, first of all, I want to address these issues well. Now, normally we're walking through books of the Bible and we preach that way. Uh, I'm not as comfortable when we take a topic. It, it's a little more difficult. But, but more importantly, the issues that we're addressing in this series, they can be painful. They are sensitive topics Uh, There is the potential to offend people and not uh, with the gospel, but in the way that I come across. And so as I begin today, I I just want to say I'm not going to speak perfectly about this topic. You're going to see me tethered a little more to my notes than usual. Um, I don't mean to be offensive to you as an individual. And so if I come across that way, please accept my apology on the front end. Um, But here's the thing. Um, These issues affect real people. People that are sitting in the room with you. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, please, as you go to your small group tonight, as you, you know, gather after the service today and you begin to discuss these things, would you please try to reflect our Savior Jesus Christ and his grace, his compassion, his patience, and his love toward other people in the way that you speak? May that be reflected in your tone. So the issue we're going to be talking about today is mental illness. Um, It is serious, it is painful, it is isolating, and it is complex. Um, Once again, I'm not going to speak perfectly about it, so please extend your grace to me. 
Um, but mental illness, it's not an abstract idea. We're preaching on a topic, but it's not something we, we experience intellectually. Uh, but for most of us, we've experienced it very personally. Mental illness is something that's affected my family. Uh, growing up, I never got to know my grandmother on my mom's side. Uh, because when my mom was three years old, um, her mom took her own life. I don't know all of what led to that. Let me just tell you, that was an incredible source of pain. She must have been going through a lot, and her death affected a lot of people. Uh, my wife was 13. Her dad took his own life. And let me just say, profound consequences of that struggle in, in her dad and then for the family that rippled outward. Um, this is something that the enemy would wish to use to bring destruction and pain and heartache. And so uh, as I talk about it, I don't do so as someone who uh, has never been touched by mental illness. We have people on our staff that struggle. Uh, Matt Duke is one of our elders who would say, man, I, I struggle with depression. So once again, we want to speak graciously and with compassion, but we also want to speak the truth of God's word to this issue. So today, I'm going to ask and answer three simple questions about this topic, but they're not easy to answer, right? The questions are easy to ask, but they're hard to answer. The first is this, what is mental illness? The second, where does it come from? And the third is, what should we do about it? What, how do we as a church respond? So in answering the first question, what is mental illness? The Mayo Clinic defines mental illness as a wide range of mental health disorders that affect your mood, your thinking, or your behavior. These include depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, addictive behaviors, and many other things. It is estimated that one in five adults in the U.S. struggle with mental illness, and that number increases to one in four worldwide. And just to be clear, this is, it, it's a growing issue, not a lessening one. As a matter of fact, among young girls that have phones and social media, mental health issues are exploding. Just a warning to you parents. Uh, untreated mental illness is one of the driving factors behind substance abuse and addiction, homelessness, and incarceration. To put it another way, if you see someone who is struggling with poverty and poverty or an addiction, mental health issues are likely involved there. Uh, but listen, mental illness doesn't always look like outward suffering. Matter of fact, you may be sitting next to someone in your row. If statistics hold true, one in five, you're sitting very close to someone who struggles with this deeply. Uh, mental illness may take on the form of inward agony and private pain. There's a man who lived in the 1800s by the name of Charles Spurgeon. He was known as the Prince of Preachers. He preached in London's Metropolitan Tabernacle. He was like the original megachurch pastor. Okay, so Metropolitan Tabernacle had seating for 5,000 people and standing room for an additional 1,000. And people would gather outside the windows just to be able to hear uh, his sermons. And so massive ministry, massive impact. Everybody wanted to hear Charles Spurgeon preach. Um, while he was preaching... Uh, people would sit, stenographers would sit uh, in his services and, and write down his sermons. And as soon as he was done, they would rush off to the printing presses where they would sell and distribute his sermons widely. Um, today, his writings and ser sermons comprise one of the best-selling series of writing in history. Profoundly influential man. His church also founded almshouses for the poor and orphanage for uh, orphans that they ran. And then the, it became known as Spurgeon's College that trained many, many pastors for ministry. But the same, same man who preached so effectively on Sundays often couldn't get out of bed on Mondays. He suffered from what he described as a minister's fainting fits. They were severe bouts of depression. He often wept uncontrollably and called himself a prisoner of his ailments. He said, I pity a dog who has to suffer what I have. He once showed up on a Sunday evening prepared to preach, but was so overtaken with anxiety, he began to shake and he had to leave unable to speak even a single word. He described the pain of mental illness in very dark terms. He said, the mind can descend far lower than the body. The flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and then no more. 
But the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each day. Mental health issues are prevalent and they are painful in our society and in the church. And as such, the church has a responsibility to respond with care and compassion to people who are hurting. Now, there are two ditches when we think about mental illness, two ditches we can get in. The first is where the church often falls. Uh, What we do with mental illness is we tend to over-spiritualize mental illness. And so what we would say to people is, if you're struggling with mental illness, it's a spiritual issue. So you need to be delivered. You need to, to pray a little harder, dig a little more into the Word. You need to believe God better. You need to persist in your faith a little more, and then everything would be okay. That's a lie. Now, the other side of that is maybe where the world would struggle, the ditch that the world would get in, and the, the world would attempt to overly, over-naturalize mental health issues. And they'll say, hey, if you're struggling, man, what you need is to go see a doctor. Like, you go see a doctor, you need to go get yourself some medicine, and then everything will be okay. Well, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And as the church... We need to compellingly call people, walk with people uh, through their journey with mental illness. Staying out of the ditches and instead walking the difficult path with people who struggle. So the, the first thing we have to do is we think about mental illness is to ask, what does God's word have to say about that? Now, what I don't have is the mental illness text to preach from. And so what we're going to do is take a larger view. Um, and, and in answering that question, uh, we're going to back up and kind of look at the foundation of all of the world's problems. Okay, so the first question we ask is, what is mental illness? The second one is, is where does it come from? Well, at the end of the day, mental illness is a result of sin and the fall. In Genesis chapter 1, we see God creating the heavens and the earth. He created the oceans and he created the mountains. He created the plants. He created the animals. He created mankind and it was good. Everything that our perfect God created was good. Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony. They walked with God and talked with him in the garden. Perfect relationship with him, uh, with each other, and with all of creation. But in Genesis chapter 3, we see that sin entered in. Adam and Eve sinned against God. And when sin entered in, man, it began to mar and break and scar everything that God had created to be good. Adam and Eve, they experienced this spiritual death where Here's the thing. God had created them in his image to live in communion with him. But when sin entered in, it marred the image of God in them so much so that they no longer knew how to rightly relate to God or to one another or even to themselves. Sin caused them spiritual death because God was completely holy and perfect and righteous. And now Adam and Eve were utterly sinful They no longer had that unbroken fellowship with God. But it wasn't just a spiritual death that occurred. There was physical death that entered in as a result of sin. And it corrupted all of God's creation. When sin entered in, sickness and disease and suffering and pain and death came with it. Because of sin, we see men and women rebelling against God. We see brother killing brother. We see deceit. We see abuse. We see slavery. We see jealousy. We see greed and and sin of a thousand different flavors, right? People going their own way, rebelling against God. And we see sickness. We see blindness. We see deafness. We see leprosy. We see shriveled limbs. And we see mental agony. In Psalm 88, the psalmist wrote these words. He said, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. 
I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all of your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in. So that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Oh, Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Since sin entered into the world, God's people and all of creation have suffered mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Since sin entered in and the world is broken and scarred by sin, no one is left untouched by it. Now you might ask, like, where does this come from in me? Why do I suffer from mental illness? Why do I have to deal with this? Well, mental illness may be the result of the sin nature that you inherited from Adam, where sin came in and took uh, your physical body that was created in the image of God, and it, it, it twisted and it broke your desires and your biology. It's, it's the same reason we see other physical illnesses in this world. It may be the result of sin that you inherited from Adam. I had a friend uh, who, kind of unusually, but from the time that he was a young man, he began to show symptoms of schizophrenia. Man, it devastated his life. He, to this day, has been unable to live any sort of normal life, like where he took care of things and handled them on his own. I sat with him one night, and, and he, he, he knew that I loved him, and he, he knew that he could trust me, and he would look at me and he would say, hey, would I know that you care about me. Would you, would you just promise me right now that no one is speaking? Because I hear voices. And I see things that aren't really there, but they seem so real. Listen, he suffered in agony. And he did so from the time that he was a little boy. Sometimes... Mental illness is just the result of the fact that we were born into a world that has been corrupted by sin. And it's a part of broken biology that we would experience mental illness. But mental illness may also be the, re the result of someone who has sinned against us. Maybe in your life you're experiencing the lingering effects of someone else's sinful acts toward you. Maybe it was physical or sexual or verbal abuse. Maybe for you, you bear scars, you bear the trauma that was caused by someone else's sin. Maybe your mental illness is merely the result of just living in a world that is marred by sin. And there is a great tragedy in our world where soldiers and police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and even private citizens, they are tormented by things that they have seen, they've heard, and they've experienced as a result of courageously serving and, and attempting to help someone else. And now they can't unsee the things that they've seen or unhear the things that they've heard. Now the final thing, and I want to say this gently, mental illness may be the result of sin that you've committed. It is possible that you are suffering because you are crushed by guilt and shame of decisions that you've made. 
things that you've done in your past, and you can't get over the shame and the guilt, like you're being crushed by those things. Well, here's the thing. At the root of all suffering is sin. It is common to all of us. We have all sinned, and as a result, we all suffer under the weight of sin. But here's the good news. There is hope. There is hope in Christ Jesus. In Psalm 34, 18, David reminds us that God is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. David, throughout the Psalms, would call God at various times his strength, his hope, his refuge, his fortress, his redeemer, the one who delivered my soul from the depths of the grave. Here's the good news. God saw you in your suffering. He knows every moment. He understands every dark thought. He knows your sin. He knows your guilt. He knows your shame. He knows the things that you have been through. And God looked down from heaven at you in your sin, in your brokenness, in your weakness. And he chose to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, to save you from sin, and to give you a new life in him, that your life could could be redeemed and reconciled back to God, and then he could begin to restore that which is broken in you, that, that process of sanctification where we are conformed back to the image of Christ, which leads us to our final question. What is mental illness? Where does it come from? The final question is this. What do we do about it? And if here we are sitting in it. I deal with it daily or weekly or, or, or maybe just monthly. There are seasonal bouts of depression. Um, what do we do with it? Maybe like Spurgeon, you feel trapped in a prison of your own mental illness. Well, the first is this, and we see this principle throughout Scripture, but we saw it uh, very clearly in 1 Peter chapter 5. The invitation of Peter is to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he might exalt us. Number one, what do we do about mental illness? We acknowledge the struggle and we invite help. I don't know what it is in us that makes us, um, and I don't know about you, I don't want to feel weak. I don't want to feel broken. And as a result, I often don't want to acknowledge my struggles or my weakness. But the truth of it is, and we've just heard this, everyone in this room is broken by sin. We're all weak. We're all helpless to save ourselves or to fix ourselves in some way. But here's the good news. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Listen, if you're here and you struggle from mental illness, I want you to know that this church loves you. We care for you. We want to support you. And we want to be here for you. We want to remind you of the goodness of God. Listen, if if you're here and you have this ongoing, like your symptoms have become unmanageable, and you're not able to just kind of get through those things, through normal support, uh, man, I want to encourage you. Acknowledge those things. Take that isolated brokenness and bring it into the light of God. Invite help spiritually. Invite help physically into your life. And so um, maybe for you is just to begin to consider, what is the nature of my mental illness? Is this spiritual? Is it physical? Or most likely it's a combination of the two. And so here's the great news. God in his goodness uh, has provided us with extraordinary doctors and modern medicine who can help us when our problems are biological or physiological in nature. God in his grace has given us psychologists and, and counselors who can help us through, through the worldly traumas that we might endure. They can help us walk through some of the struggles or learn how to cope better. And God has given us his spirit and his church to help us when our issues are spiritual in nature. I just want to encourage you today. Acknowledge your struggle, and don't don't suffer alone. Acknowledge the struggle. Drag it into the light. Bring it out there and ask God to begin to heal it. Ask others to, to help you. Acknowledge the struggle and invite help into your life. Okay? So that's number one. Number two is this. I want to invite you to believe the gospel. If you're here and and you've never trusted in Jesus, 
You've never come to a place where you understood the gospel and trusted in Jesus to save you from your sin, where you've cried out to God and say, Jesus, would you save me? Like, I recognize my sin and my need for a Savior. Today, I want to invite you to trust in Jesus, to remember that Jesus saw you in your sin that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you, and he rose from the grave victorious over sin to give you new life in him. So maybe that's you, and it's like today, you just need to cry out to Jesus to save you. That's step one. Like if we're ever going to get better, man, it is following after Jesus, the God of all creation. If you're here and you're burdened by the weight of your guilt and shame, You need to know that Jesus died there on the cross for your sin, your guilt, and your shame. There on the cross, Jesus took our sin, my sin, your sin, our guilt, our shame, and he placed them on his son, Jesus. And Jesus endured the punishment that we deserve. And as he hung there on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. Jesus took it away perfectly. He endured that punishment completely, which means we no longer bear our sin and our guilt and our shame. As a matter of fact, as Jesus took those things from us and placed them on Jesus, he took the perfect righteousness of Jesus and he credited those things to our account. Once again, if you need to trust in Jesus today, man, I want to invite you to bow your head. You can do it right now. Cry out to God. Ask him to save you from your sin and to give you new life in him. But here's the thing. It's not just unbelievers who struggle with mental illness. You might be here today and be like, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. I love Jesus and I still struggle. Well, the admonition is the same. We don't just believe the gospel as unbelievers and then walk away as Christians. We continue to believe the gospel even when life gets difficult. Here, here's the temptation when we suffer as believers. The temptation in the midst of pain and hardship and suffering is to begin to view God's goodness through the lens of our own suffering. And through the lens of our suffering, we might begin to ask questions of, God, do you really care? Do you really love me? Are you really good? Are you really for me, God? But that's the wrong approach. Rather than viewing God's goodness through the lens of our own suffering, we should view our suffering through the lens of God's goodness. The cross of Jesus Christ is a constant reminder of God's overwhelming and sacrificial love for us, of his overwhelming and sacrificial love for you. God is for you. He loves you. And he wants to walk with you through anything that you might face in this life. He knows your struggles. He sees your pain. He knows those private thoughts. He loves you and he cares for you. Romans 8.34 tells us that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Can I just encourage you to view your suffering through the lens of God's goodness, through the hope of the gospel. The gospel is good news, but we've got to keep on believing it, reminding ourselves that God is for us, that he loves us, that he cares for us. That God is a God who weeps with those who weep and mourns with those who mourn. Church, we serve a God who still heals and delivers, who still performs miracles. So we should boldly approach him in faith, asking him to save us completely, asking him to restore us and to heal us completely, right? That is, God is still in the miracle working business. He is divine. He is all sovereign. He can and he does heal But as believers, even if he chooses not to, we continue to walk in faith. We persevere in faith even if God doesn't heal us immediately. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us a story of, of a thorn that he had in his own life. And we're not told what that thorn in his flesh was. But one thing that isn't hard to deduce from the passage is that thorns are painful. Thorns make us limp. They cause us uh, ongoing and increasing pain, especially when they're not removed. The Apostle Paul, he, he prayed to God three times. God, would you take this thorn from me? This thing that I'm suffering from, the thing that's causing me pain, would you take this thorn away? And God did not. But instead, he 
he chose to remind Paul that his power is made perfect in our weakness, that his grace is sufficient for us. I don't know if God would heal you immediately. I don't know if you're going to walk a lot of steps with this thorn in your side, but I want you to know that his grace is sufficient for you and that God's power is made perfect in your weakness. Once again, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 reminds us that after we have suffered a little while, he himself will restore and confirm and strengthen and establish us. How long will we bear the thorn? I don't know. But I do know that God is faithful. And that one day, well, we know this for Christians, all suffering is temporary. And one day Jesus Christ will return. And we will be with him. And when we are with Christ, there will be no more suffering, no more sickness, no more pain, and no more death. Keep Believing the gospel of Jesus Christ, even in the midst of your pain. Acknowledge your sin and invite help. Keep believing the gospel. And and the final thing is this. Seek care from his church. Just as is true with any other struggle, God did not intend for you to struggle alone. But rather, God in his wisdom has uniquely gifted And called and situated, he placed people in the church that we might care for one another in the midst of our struggles. There are people who would love to share your burden, who would love to enter into your pain. It's often true that God uses people who have gone through similar things to minister to us in the midst of our struggles. And what a joy it is sometimes just to hear that we're not alone in our struggling We're not alone in our suffering. We're not alone in our pain. Part of being the church of Jesus, church isn't something we attend. It's something that we are. We're to be the church of Jesus. And part of belonging to Jesus in his church is bearing one another's burdens. It's caring for other people. And this is what the covenant of membership looks like. It says, you know what? I'm going to be devoted to you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to care for you. When you're killing it in life, when things are good, when it's time to celebrate, and I'm also going to walk with you when life's falling apart. And when you're suffering and you're struggling, I'm going to bear with you in that moment. I'm going to show God's grace to you. I'm going to remind you of the goodness of the gospel. I'm going to speak the word of God to you and remind you when you can't see it. We want to point each other to the hope of the gospel and to the truth of God's word. And we walk with each other as we seek healing from the things that we've endured as a result of living in this fallen and broken world. But here's the thing. The church can't care for the burdens that you don't share. God has called and equipped, and he's gifted people to care for you, but the church can't care for burdens that you don't share. Some of you have been trying to bear your burdens all by yourself, and you're being crushed. Some of you are suffering in silence and in isolation. And it's time to invite other people into your pain, to drag your struggle, your suffering, into the light and ask God to begin healing it. Ask God to bring other people in with you to help you carry it. Listen, just a reminder, people that try to care for you, they won't always do so perfectly. And neither will you when you enter into the suffering of others. We won't always get it right. But what we do is we show each other the same love and grace and mercy that Jesus Christ has shown to us. And we strive to bear one another's burdens with understanding and compassion. Um, In this church, uh, we have regeneration that is specifically geared toward people who are going through life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. It's been profound in my life, and it's been profound in the lives of our staff and many others. Last week, we got to celebrate the commencement of many people who are finding freedom um, through Jesus Christ and through his spirit, walking with another group of believers, kind of wa- working through their pain. And we have reengaged if these issues are showing up in your marriage. And we have community groups that are small groups of people that are there specifically to bear burdens with one another. And we counsel each other from the word of God. And we point people back to the hope we have in Jesus. Seek care from God's church. Now, here's the thing. Today I'm going to invite you, if you s- suffer from mental illness, 
I'm going to invite you to step into the light, to make that known and to give us an opportunity to pray for you. So my hope is not to embarrass you. It's not to single you out. But in just a minute, I'm going to ask you, if you're here and you struggle with mental illness, to raise your hand. You don't have to stand up right where you are to raise your hand. And we're going to ask everyone else around you, as, we, as the band comes forward and plays, and we have this time of invitation, we're going to ask the people around you just to come and begin to pray. Pray for God's healing in your life. Pray for God's guidance and wisdom that he would lead you to a source of help, that he would lead you to a source of comfort, either through God's people or maybe it's, it's through a medical intervention or a psychologist or whatever it might be. We're just going to pray for each other and ask that God would, you, would work in, in, in your life to bring healing and help to you. And so right here in this moment, I'm going to ask you to be bold. And if you're here and you struggle with mental illness, would you just raise your hand right now? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many people in this room are suffering. And so right now I'm going to invite everyone else to stand up and to gather around these men and women. I'm going to ask you to go to them and pray for them fervently during this time of response. I'll come back in a minute and gather us up and we can close in prayer. But spend some time praying over these men and women who need us. We are the church.